Does everyone hear me? Yep, I'm Kevin Stratford. I've worked for MASC, Maritime Archaeology Sea Trust, for the last five years. Prior to that, I worked with a few people in this room actually at Wessex and uh, studied at Bournemouth before that. Today, I want to talk to you about professional practices within community archaeology, particularly in the UK, really, and uh, well, under, under the, uh, the UNESCO annexes. So, who are MASC? For those who aren't aware, we are the Maritime Archaeology Sea Trust, a charitable company based recently based in Paul Dorset. We've just purchased uh, an industrial unit where we're going to house our uh, future work on the HMS Invincible for the next three to four years, maybe longer with conservation, etc. We are a uh, UNESCO accredited NGO. We've, uh, we've actually been involved with South American, uh, the Caribbean uh, meetings recently talking about diver training over there because we run our own basic diver training, similar to the NAS, but already directly under PADI, SSI, BSAT, going directly towards the diving, the actual diving uh, companies themselves. So we have been involved in a number of major shipwrecks projects, including the Swash Channel, which I won't go into too deeply, because I know Grant's got to talk after our break on this. That's out of pool as well. And a couple of the carvings, as you can see on the right, they were some of the things that Mast helped to uh, fund the conservation thereof afterwards as well. Amazing things. Uh, the Bamber Castle wreck, which is actually just up the road, and was that picture there. It's an amazing site, really intertidal site with nearly three quarters of the wreck complete, plus deck features including windlass and two, two masts. But unfortunately, that's been reburied because it came out after the big tidal surge a few years ago, which stripped metres of sand off the beaches there, and within Within 18 months, it's covered back over, but it is now protected under the Ancient Monuments Act as well. So again, and then we also worked on the Esmeralda in Oman as members of uh, partnership with Bournemouth University, the Oman Ministry of Cultural Heritage, National Geographic, and also uh, Blue Water Recoveries. And that's a picture of uh, myself actually with a member of the Omani Ministry of uh, cultural heritage and part of it was primary survey, primary excavation of two, well, one untouched wreck from uh, Fasco de Gama's fourth fleet that went to India in the early 1500s. But it was also um, infrastructure building, skills building from the actual capability of being able to go diving all the way through to post decks and museum processes, which the material is now in the museum, some of the material anyway, uh, being studied and conserved there. Also, we've been working on the Alderney Elizabethan shipwreck. I've uh, been going out there every summer for the last three or four years. We'll be back out there in September. So it's part funding this as well, helping out the states because also they're low on, on money. So we'll cover our costs to get out there and we'll be put up by uh, local representatives. But that's uh, an interesting site because it's probably one of the earliest examples of a standardized cannons within, within the Navy, which if you pick up a cannibal on, on, on the ship, you could put it in any cannon and it'll work, which believe it or not, wasn't normal before that site. And then obviously the HMS Invincible, which in partnership with Bournemouth University and the Royal Navy Museum, we received a two million, just over two million LIBOR grant last year to uh, excavate, uh, recover and conserve a lot of material from that site, hopefully, which will end up in the museum within the dockyards adjacent to Chris. Chris's side, actually. <laughs> okay, so uh, during my time uh, at MAST, we did a lot of training with uh, paddy divers and BSAC divers, as I said, and a lot of talking to them. I realised we've got a problem in this country with World War One and World War Two wrecks, especially the density on the amount, sheer amounts of wrecks that we have, both in this war these waters and international waters abroad, is probably pales in comparison to many other people. These wrecks usually made solely of metal, different types of metal, or in many cases in precarious positions, and they're very hard to preserve underwater, especially because of the different composites of metals and their different corrosive properties there. So therefore, I mean, there's some even on the verge of collapse, like I don't know how many of you dive, but the James Egan Lane out of Plymouth, if you go there on the right day, you can actually see the sides of the ship waving in the tide. I just don't want to be there the day that thing collapses, but... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real problem, and I think we're, we're not really doing anything at the moment. So, so many wrecks, not enough archaeologists or funding to do anything with them, or significant with them. Most of the work to date has been done by 
the UKHO as a basic uh, geographical sur ge yeah, geophysical survey of these sites. So you don't really have much beyond general dimensions, height, width, length, and whatnot. That's not actually looking at their condition and, and whatever objects are on board and the people that are on board. At the end of the day, it's all about the people that were serving on board these ships. And just a list of how big the wreck is, is doesn't really do anything to answer that. So within the diving community, I had a little look around and of the most popular 100 UK dive sites, this was from uh, DiverNet and was done a few years ago in 2015, over half were sunk during one of the two world wars that's within the British waters this is. The sheer number of vessels lost during these wars and their survival of wrecks in that period, yeah, means that approximately half of all dives undertaken in the UK that are not commercial and not archaeological, these are just sports dives, are probably done on a wreck from one of the world, two world wars. Either that or it'll be uh, you'll do a dive and a second dive might be on a different site which could be from that period. And uh, published I think by BSAC, this is roughly eight to ten years ago, there's two million qualified divers within the UK which I'd suggest has probably gone up since then. So I'm doing a bit of uh, rough calculations because this isn't published anywhere, worked out we should say one of them does, they all dive once per year within the UK. You could be anywhere between quarter, like a few hundred thousand and a million dives on shipwrecks where no discernible information is coming back within the archaeological community where they're just going visiting taking pictures putting the pictures in their whatever facebook social media pages and nothing's actually being done with it not even a, a baseline level of uh, condition of these sites to see where the corrosion's happening where the sites are falling apart and if particular parts of the site should be looked at to uh, to undertake some form of preservation in situ thereon. Okay, so as I said, the number of the dives used in these sites is in huge disproportion to any work we've done. So I looked at it and I thought there must be a way that we could try and engage these dives and make them useful to us really as a community and useful to, them, to the, the people who are doing the dives as well because I'm sure that sports divers, anyone that's in here and other sports divers, they you get bored diving the same thing over and over again. To go down there with a job to do, is, even if it's taking pictures of particular features, it's, uh, it adds a little bit more to their diving and engages them with their history as well. And hopefully uh, educates them along the way. So the aim was to facilitate and encourage existing dive groups around the country, but initially we had to, we had to shrink this down because we went to the HLF for money and they suggested that we go for a regional thing and it's actually based in the northeast. So we've had a, a local paddy dive club based in Ashington a few miles up the road who we uh, decided to uh, try and roll out this project idea with them. So what, when I spoke to them initially there was uh, a little bit of concern. They were thinking we're trying to take away their fun time, tell them off and all that. As you do normally when you're dealing with people who, who put time, effort and a lot of money into what they do as well. So I told we, we had a conversation that was by providing these divers with the skills and even actually funding them to supply them with the equipment, just basic survey equipment, tape measures, rulers, all of these kind of things which most divers aren't going down with. Everyone's got a camera these days, but they're not going down there with any of these, just even a notebook most of them aren't going in with. So we, we've got some funding together and uh, decided to, yeah, sorry, Lost myself. But yeah, decided to um, to help them to help them engage with these sites by providing with these materials. So then, uh, the other issue that a lot of the divers had, they thought we were attempting to police them with the looting issues that several of us have mentioned today. I think um, we know it's a big issue around the world, not just in the UK. And hopefully, by in, uh, by engaging them with these sites, it will actually decrease the problem, which is like the metal wrecks in the last thirty years, which is a strong thing that UNESCO have said as well and part of English Heritage's uh, protected wreck dive trail theories as well, I believe. So, the background to the project we had, it was, uh, it was developed and planned in 2015 as a, as a pilot that could, be work, that could be worked into whatever region you are, really. So we, we focused on the North East because it was an under an under-dived under resource, really. This is an area where very little archaeological work has been done to date. I know English Heritage or Historic England have moved into the region and done 
done a few pieces of diving trips in the last couple of summers, I believe. But it's before that, there was very little, really. But the key aspect is looking to engage the people of the North East with their history of shipwrecks of World War One and World War Two, along with the, uh, the stories of the, the region itself and the, the wider history as the front line, especially in World War One. The North East was being bombed and from both sea and air, whilst also having a, a huge minefield just off the coast. So it's, uh, yet, yeah, whilst this was going on, transport ships are going back and forth effectively across no man's land, delivering us our coal, delivering us our food, delivering us everything we, we enjoyed at the time. So the team we put together, the idea was to survey and research the shipwrecks from the world war periods over an 18 month period. HLF, uh, who funded the project, uh, insisted that we had a non-diving element, although we were going to train the divers to do the research side of it as well. They were, un they were uh, not unwilling, they, were, they would have preferred us to have a non-diving element because it becomes more inclusive, which turned out to be a great idea because otherwise I don't think they would have got it all done in 18 months. So we sent a team of volunteers trained in research skills and techniques locally up at the Woodhorn Archives, which is uh, an old... Uh, Colliery, I think, just north of Ad, uh, Ashington as well. And we taught them really a lot of things, just how to look onto the online databases and where to go for this information, and also um, what to record, what is useful information for us and what is not. A lot of, a lot of these people have uh, already had an interest in, in local history and have been involved in heritage lottery projects before, but not of a maritime nature. So it's engaging and developing new skills in these people. So, part of the talk that we had there was they needed a clear, defined research topics, but that weren't so rigid that they didn't have freedom to go and find things that interested them. So, alongside the shipwrecks, it's the associated stories, so the people that were on board, the, uh, the, the wrecking processes, or where it was built, etc. General World War I stuff, the maritime history in the Northeast, which was, during both wars, was a huge, huge producer of coal, ships, everything you name for the war effort. A lot of it came from up in the northeast and was transported around the British Isles at the time. Again, again, always with the HLF they were saying the key idea for them was engaging the volunteers with their past. And a part of that I decided was we should encourage them to find the stories that they find interesting. So you let you give them the freedom to go out and find these things, then they'll come back with gems. Because if they find the site, they find the stories they find interesting, so will we. We're all going to find them interesting. So, well, as aside from the research team, we also had a team of ten volunteers that are trained using our MAST basic archaeological diver course. Sent them. We, we came up here to the theory base with them, and then brought them down to the quarry training site that we have in Plymouth over two days to uh, undertake basic survey, which also covers legislation, UK laws, uh, archaeological practice, goes over different, a few different uh, site examples, but, and also encompasses uh, UNESCO uh, convention rules and whatnot. So, the team locally, led by a gentleman, Steve Brown, who I, who I, cannot, I cannot say thanks to enough, really. It wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been as successful as it was without this gentleman, a, a, key, a key member of the team who led and, and led and focused the project from the northeast. So, and the survey re results are currently being written up and are actually, uh, unfortunately I don't, I haven't finished the write-up yet, the project finishes in the next three weeks, by which time I will have a, a fully completed report, which should be available online as well, should anyone be interested. So, the wrecks, what were the wrecks we looked at? Initially, SS Coriton, British steamship, lost in 1941, this was chosen because it's shallow, relatively benign environment. We could pretty much guarantee a dive on this site during the summer, even in uh, dodgy-ish weather conditions. So we thought we need to cover aspects of both nationality and ease of use, ease of access, was also having slightly more challenging sites, which we'll see in a bit. The SS Kammer, a locally built vessel during the riveting stage as well, while that was a huge industry here in the First World War. We also looked at another, the Eston, which is another British cargo ship built locally, in the, which was lost in the Second World War. And the comparison between the two is great because you go from riveting to uh, welding, plate welding and still. So it's uh, 
it's, a, it's the, the change locally as well, which I think led to the demise in the local shipping industry, especially the amount of people that are employed anyway. Another one, the MV Oslo Fjord, Norwegian troop carrier. We actually had them out, did a little bit of side scan where, off you can see on the right, they found a couple of the boilers, I believe, there. It's, uh, this was just done off the, the back of the side scan of a rib. So it's really, really cheap, free, basically. They just went out and did it for us. But this site was particularly interesting because it's, we had an environmental biologist come out with us and as part of the volunteer dive team, and she's noticed lots of invasive species on this site. She's uh, and written a help, helpful little report for us about this and how it's uh, affecting the, uh, the structure itself with some of, these, some of these species which are helping the corrosion, really, and making them fall apart even more. And then of my favourite one of the lot is a little German submarine, UC-32, lost within sight of the coast, actually, in 1917. She blew up whilst laying a mine, and, uh, yeah, her own mine, basically, laying mines to sink our ships, blew up and blew the bow off and then sank. But the very interesting thing that not many local people knew about this was that within a week, the, the, uh, the secret naval group called the Tin Openers turned up on site, dive, so they dive it under the cover of darkness, go in to a wreck which has had bodies on it for, the, for a week, in black, going through, looking for any intelligence they can find, which, I mean, to do that is, is another level of crazy, I think. But uh, it's, a very, it's a very interesting site because of, because of that extra story, and no local people really knew. They know about the wreck, but they don't know about the stories that happened after. And I think this was only released became declassified in the last 20 years or so. But another funny thing that happened on this site during the summer, we had, uh, what was it, a naval, a naval warship was in the each area and the skipper of the boat decided he had a dive team that he wanted, and a, a UXO dive team that went down on this site and attempted to, uh, well, blow up uh, <laughs> One of the sub, one of the um, torpedoes that had been rolled out of the the broken hull and was left on the side. And he invited the me, the TV down and everyone. Turned out he had no permission from anyone within the <laughs> anyone within the MOD to do this, and that caused untold amounts of issues for us and actually delayed our project a bit because we needed to get access to this. And it wasn't even successful. They just blew up the charge and didn't even blow up the uh, the torpedo. So luckily there was no real damage done to it either. Okay, so what are the impacts then of uh, UNESCO on uh, community archaeology in, in this country? I would argue that UNESCO can have great impacts on some nations and lesser so for others. I think within the UK, we had a strong, very strong advocation of archaeological community prior to UNESCO and a very strong uh, heritage legislation as well to back that up. And see, our protected wrecks Rex rely on volunteer time and expertise probably since its inception. As Chris spoke about earlier, he had volunteer divers on the Mary Rose excavation. And I don't think there's probably been a protected site in the UK that hasn't been studied or investigated by community archaeologists at some stage. So really, they are key within our field. So I would argue that standards and professional practice on a day-to-day -day basis has changed little post-UNESCO in the UK, from my experience at least. So looking, looking uh, slightly more deeply into this, this is provided to me by Alison actually, uh, a list of, uh, since 2002 when uh, then EH took over site management licensing on behalf of DCMS, a total of 80 excavation licenses have been issued. The figures also suggest that the UNESCO adoption had little or no impact on the protected rec site licenses that were being granted as well. So the only significant changes really is the increase as the sign over there shows, there's when the protected wreck site trails started coming out. And uh, many of these sites, like you see on the bottom of the picture, they have uh, uh, station markers put on and as such need excavation licenses. So that's why there is an increase towards the more recent years. So, conclusions. Community archaeology is key in the study of World War I and World War II wrecks, both in this country and around the globe, I believe. Funding has been made available through various streams recently, especially for World War I at the moment, because we're going through the anniversary stages. HLF have recently announced a, another big chunk of money. 
which is available for uh, World War I sites this year and other, lots of other smaller local charities offering similar things, especially for the community involvement side. But the one thing I would like to, like to see is the diving organisations, the PADIs, the SSIs, the BSACs, is, is for them to engage with UNESCO and actually bring in their underwater cultural heritage guidelines as part of the diver training, much like when you learn to drive a car, you learn about the laws of the road, when you learn to dive, you should learn about the laws of the sea, but they don't. We started this conversation actually on uh, with Paddy and SSI. Paddy were, uh, uh, how can we say politely, dismissive. <laughs> but uh, SSI seem a little bit keener to engage, but they are actually a lot smaller at the moment. Really, we need all of them to do this. But it's, uh, it's proven a bit, of a bit of a hard battle. So, though the UK's heritage industry may not be perfect, if, uh, in my view anyway, we are a world leader in the field. And UNESCO, the UNESCO partnerships, agreements, uh, ratification countries, anyone who's engaging with these organisations offers us a great expertise, an opportunity, sorry, to export our expertise, as you mentioned yourself in your uh, thing, as we were, we were able to do in Oman as well. So I think um, now is the time, really. Let's get out there and find these wrecks. Thank you for listening. Any questions?